Welcome to Kedem. Today we are with Professor Michal Bar Asher Sigal. Uh, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. And the your main focus of research is the Babylonian Talmud and the beginning of Christianity and the Judaism. And uh, I would like to sta start our conversation from the very simple question. Uh, we all know two religions today, the Judaism and Christianity. Can you please explain us when these uh, two religions, Judaism and Christianity, are parted away? It's a very good question. And there isn't a simple answer to that question. Um, for the, to answer this, we actually need to talk about the history of the scholarship of Judaism and Christianity. The assumption uh, for a very, very long time was that Christianity basically became Christianity with Jesus. Meaning, uh, let's say when Jesus gets crucified in the year 30, and, and then his students operate in the first century CE, and uh, uh, the communities around him, uh, for a long time the assumption was that Jesus in himself was Christian, and Christianity starts with Jesus. Scholarship became uh, um, you know, a little bit more careful and, and basically the assumption was that around the beginning of the second century this is where Judaism and Christianity really parted ways with his students and became two, Judaism and Christianity became two different uh, religions. The stage after that in scholarship was to say, well, it doesn't really work with the details. If we're looking at, this is around the 60s and the 70s, when we're looking and really reading uh, the, the, the Gospels, right, the, the stories that talk about the, the birth of Jesus, his life, and his students, when we look at them carefully, and even Paul, one of his, uh, the, his main you know, follower that really spreads Christianity around, when we read them carefully, we actually see that they're talking in a language that works well within a Jewish milieu. Meaning when we're looking at the first generation of what we call Jesus' circle, right? His students and, his, and, and, his, and, 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 and Paul and, and, and the conversation that's happening there, it looks more to be part of their Jewish milieu rather than something new and completely different that starts with that time period. So then scholarship became more careful to say, actually, in the beginning at least, we should understand the Jesus movement as part of Judaism of the Second Temple uh, period. That was a very important step in, in, in the scholarship to say, as opposed to understanding Christianity as the new religion right from the beginning, as something that comes in the Greco-Roman atmosphere and part of this world, going back and looking at what we call Jewish Jesus or Paul within Judaism, and right, and look at the milieu that they do, and then Obviously, Judaism and Christianity doesn't split there because Jesus and his followers and the followers of Jesus is just one sort within many ways to be Jewish in the second century C. And that's interesting, right? So you, we, we look at that and we say, we know how it ends. We know that it ends in a special thing called Christianity, but it starts as being part of what we call Second Temple Judaisms, right? The different groups and the different ways to be uh, uh, Jewish at that time period. Now, what's interesting to talk is about the question, right? You asked me, when did those two religions parted? And this leads to a term that we need to talk when we talk about Judaism and Christianity, which is the parting of the wave, right? So the question that scholarship kept asking, and this is what we just discussed, is when did they part, right? So I said, some people thought that this was at the time of Jesus. Later, scholarship became more you know, nuance and said, no, it happened in the second century to see. And then scholarship came and said, no, no, actually, in fact, it was much later. It was, I don't know, third, fourth century. This is when the parting of the ways actually happened. And in fact, in the beginning, it was much more closer. But then scholarship tended to stop and said, and, and kind of looked at it and said, maybe there is a problem with our question. Because the question of the parting of the ways kind of assumes Right? The metaphor of the parting of the ways assumed that there was a way, one way. And then at some point there is a moment in time when those two, this one way becomes two definite and distinct ways. Which assumes that there was first such a moment that we can point at and say that was the moment. And second, that from then on there were two distinct ways. 
right? So we have this like picture, as you can see in the, in the image, of a way and then two ways that separates from it, right? Something like that, a crossword that you can actually imagine. But is that picture if we actually work with the history of what we know of Second Temple Judaism? So let's start with that, right? So the, this one way from which we start with, what way was that? Are we talking about one Judaism? Which is it? Is it the biblical Judaism? Is it everything we know about Second Temple Judaism tells us otherwise, right? I would highly suggest watching this movie by Monty Python, right? Bri the life of Brian really represents how messy things were in Second Temple. There was a lot of cults, a lot of groups, each one trying to, to claim something else, each one talking about messianism in a different way. The end of time, many, many, many groups, even leading to scholarship calling it the Judaisms of Second Temple Judaism, there were a lot of groups, so there wasn't one way to do Judaism. We, even in writing, we have the Qumran people writing that we read and it looks totally different from what we find from rabbinic Judaism later on, which is even very different from what we saw in biblical Judaism. So what is this one way that we imagine exists before the split? And then when we're talking about this metaphor of parting, so there was a moment in history when it parted, I don't know, the destruction of the temple, the death of Jesus, the, the, the Val Kochva revolt, that moment that the people talk about, everything in the sources that we see, and I think we'll talk about this in the next uh, hour, actually suggests something much more complex in a, in a, in a, in a, in a continuum, right? In a, in a process that takes time over time in which there wasn't such one such moment, but in fact, a long process where we see in some but cases... Which eventually led to two established religions which we have now. At the end, but, but there wasn't like one event that we can say this is where it happened, but it, it, it took time, it was a long process in which depends on where you're talking about, which area, what are we reading, what do we mean by religion, and then let's talk about the two ways. Even saying two different uh, Judaisms, maybe there is a Judaism and Christianity or two different ways, but do those ways never meet? Is there no connection? Do they turn each one in a different direction and there's no connection from then on? And are there one way? Everything we know about Christianity tells us there's many, many different ways of Christianity. So there isn't one way. And many ways within Judaism, as we say, the Babylonian Talmud and rabbinic literature just shows us how many views and stuff. So even the way, the rabbinic way of Judaism is also complicated. And even that, even if we assume that there's, you know, within each religion, did they never meet again? That's it, they went each their separate way. Is there no connection between them? Is there no influences? Is there no dialogue between them? So that's actually what I wanted to ask you about, the influence. So if you go to the beginning, okay, end of the second uh, temple period, and uh, before, long before the Christianity prevailed and uh, became the dominant religion in the world, and when Judaism had to you know, treat itself as uh, inferior compared to Christianity success. But before that, how went this influence? Who actually influenced uh, uh, more? And uh, how this uh, coexistence in the beginning actually took place? This is, this is uh, a good question because I know we're talking about metaphors today a lot, but one more metaphor. When we talk about influence and stuff, the question to ask, which is, which is a way, by the way, a word that we don't like to use in scholarship, because influence in, uh, indicate that one religion was the dominant and the important one, and one was the inferior who got influence. So we don't like that word so much because it kind of suggests a, a power struggle between them. But, and that actually is reflected in one metaphor. So when people talk about Judaism and Christianity, they used to talk about the mother religion and the daughter religion, right? So there was a mother, which is Judaism, and from which Christianity arose, now developed. The problem with this metaphor is that first the daughter is like the more developed, right? Because it came after. And also it suggests that Judaism came before Christianity, which is true, but the Judaism that came before Christianity is Biblical Judaism. It's not Rabbinic Judaism. Yeah, it's actually an Israeli cult. cult Exa of Israeli people. Yeah, and so when we're talking about the relationship between Judaism and Christianity, we actually mean Rabbinic Judaism. And Rabbinic Judaism, the first 
book that we have is the Mishnah, which was redacted at the end of the second century and the beginning of the third century CE. So in fact, we have early Christian sources that are earlier than that. So scholarship began to talk about the metaphor of the two siblings, right? The, so the, we should the, understand, maybe we do not recognize it, that the Gospels actually are written before the first rabbinic text. The uh, rabbinic text we have. So obviously we have oral tradition and then the, the, the rabbinic tradition maybe happened, but it's around the same time. And so this is when scholarship starts talking about siblings, right? The sister religions, right? So it's developing side by side, in fact, at the same time. So it's not a mother-daughter. There isn't like a, a tree and its roots, right? This is, we see that in church fathers, so the, the, in, in, in the church, when they talk about the roots of Christianity in Judaism, but in fact, the tree that becomes Christianity. Again, always this power struggle. You know, we owe some death to Judaism, but we develop to be better. This is a, um, a, a, a supersessionism talk, right? Who, who's better than the other? Uh, but when we're talking about two religions side by side and developing side by side, uh, I think it represents better the relationship between two, those two religions. Now, so who influenced who, right? That's the question. So again, if we're talking about two religions living side by side, the most important thing we need to know is that the Bible, uh, what we call the Hebrew Bible, or the, the some Christian call about the Old Testament, stands at the root of those two religions. They go back and forth and, and addressing it, and, and, and they interpret it, some verses the same way, some verses differently, and they talk about it. But we also have the cult around it, right? The praxis and the cult and beliefs that those two religions share or not share and discuss. Messiah, charity, repentance, all kinds of stuff. Practice, how, what do, you, do you do? Do you, do you keep kashrut for food? Do you circumcise your son? Do you So all kinds of questions that are not always have to do with the Bible and has a lot to do with theology and, and, and praxis and all kinds of stuff that are also being debated at the same time into a religion. And if we look at that in the complex picture, which is now where scholarship is to look at the details of that picture, we see, and that's the end result, and that's the, the answer to your question. What was the relationship with those two religions? The answer is, it was complicated. Because human beings are complicated, and religions are complicated, and cultures are complicated, and they had a complicated relationship. So we can see polemics. They're fighting. Fiercely, we see anti-Jewish writings by Christian early on in the second century, beginning of the second century, where Christians say, "Oh, those Jews with their superstitions, and they believe in the following the the lunar calendar and all kinds of stuff with fasting and what's the stupid stuff." And what. but on the other hand, we can see as late as the fifth century, we can see uh, where uh, we have laws that say. Uh, for, to Christian, stop eating the matzah that the Jews sent to you on, uh, on, on Passover. Or we see evidence of, 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 of uh, Christian being circumcised. Or in the 4th century CE, we see Chrysostomus, a church father, yelling at his uh, church followers and saying, him, Stop fasting on Yom Kippur. Stop going to the synagogue for, for the festival of the, of, the, of the trumpets, right? This is Rosh Hashanah. Stop going and sitting with their, in, in their booths, Sukkot. Stop doing all this stuff. So all of a sudden we see, as late as that, evidence of actual context between them. And we were looking at the rabbinic sources, which is what I do. This is my profession. I look at the rabbinic literature and I see there, this is all new, this is all new scholarship, but we see all of a sudden that the Jews polemicize about Christianity. They say Jesus burned in hell. He's, he's sitting in boiling excrement. The Talmud says that Jesus sits in hot poop. And it says that uh, Jesus was, you know, killed and, and, and talk about all, all of the sins of Jesus. But on the other hand, it has and adopts a lot of Christian monastic ideas about repentance. And it talks about... Uh, um, question of charity and prayer in ways that are very similar to questions and with ideas that they borrow and think together from the questions. So, and even if they're polemicizing, we talked about heretic stories, stories about heretics in the Talmud, Christian heretics. So on the one hand, polemicize and argue and fight against what the Christians are saying. 
On the other hand, to fight, they need to know a lot of the stuff material about uh, Christians. So it shows me on the one hand that they polemicize and fight against. On the other hand, they know enough of Christianity to do that. So it both gives me the polemics and the acquaintance of it. And lastly, even when they talk about Jesus in the Talmud, they can do very harsh things. And, and, and actually, the Jesus in the Talmud is a good way to demonstrate your question. When the, the Talmud talks about Jesus in the Talmud, scholarship at first started to say, oh, maybe this is historical. Maybe we can learn something about historical Jesus. We can't. This is later tradition. This is fourth, fifth century about Jesus. But the stories about Jesus and Talmud, there's not a lot. There's a few stories, I don't know, 10 or something like that. Stories about Jesus and Talmud, maybe less. Uh, a few passages. And on the one hand, it really shows familiarity with the New Testament tradition about Jesus, which is very, very interesting. But how do they know and whatever? We have, as I said, very harsh criticism of, of Jesus for being, for example, uh, promiscuous going with whores and all kinds of stuff, doing stuff with women, and his end is horrible at the end of time. But on the other hand, the Talmud as well preserves a story that says Jesus was once a student of the rabbi, and a very important student of the rabbi. And in fact, one story in the Talmud even says, we could have kept him. It was a misunderstanding. We dealt with this wrong. When the story is being composed, whoever composed the story knows the end. There was Christianity one at the end of the day. But there's still a sense of this could have been done differently. We could have retained that. We remember he was once one of ours. We remember that he was a sage. He was learned in the Torah. He was one of us. But something happened there and a misunderstanding and we were too harsh on him and we, we, didn't, we weren't smart enough to keep him. So whoever writes his story still has a sense of this could have ended differently, which is extremely interesting to find in a text that redacted so late. So to conclude with this example, to say the situation is complicated. It depends what you're reading and how you're reading. And everything that the sources tell us, tell us that just, just as people are complicated and communities are complicated, such as the connection between Judaism and Christianity, it was complex. It depends on what you're reading and where you're reading and what time period, what genre of literature, and always this tension between, on the one hand, defining who you are against the other and saying, we're not that, and we're polemicizing, and we don't like that. And on the other hand, a lot of instances on the ground where Jews and Christians actually were very much in touch and very much in conversation. So those two religions developed side by side in and against one another in, where, in their identity which was being built. We know that it's, it, it, it's initial period of Christianity have uh, fought a lot with the Judaic, what was presumed to be a Judaic traditions. And we know a lot of examples of that. Uh, but could you tell us if there is a, a struggle against uh, Christ Christian traditions inside Talmud and if we have uh, examples of Christianity influencing the uh, uh, new uh, rabbinic religion? Good question. Uh, so. The question, the answer to that is that we have to make a difference between early rabbinic literature and later, right? The Tanaitic one, which is the first and second century CE, and the one that comes later on in the Ramoraic period, so third, fourth, fifth century, maybe later than that. And then, so the difference is in the first corpus, in the Mishnah and the Tosefta, we have very, very little reference to Christianity. Which is interesting, because Christianity was already around, but it doesn't seem to have bothered the rabbis so much, or at least the redacted are it. Maybe it has to do something with the nature of the sources from that time period, which are very low, fo low focused rather than uh, um, otherwise. So very focused on halakha and, and, and Jewish law. And, but we don't have a lot of evidence. There is a very famous uh, passage in the Tosefta that talks about Jesus and, and Jesus followers, but, but very, very, very little. Which led some scholars to say Christianity just didn't matter to the rabbis at this point. When does it start being interesting? I'm not sure that it's completely true, but at least that's what we have. When does it get interesting? It gets interesting in the later period. And I think it has to do with chronology, when Christianity becomes, beginning of the fourth century, Constantine first makes Christianity legal and then 
um, um, converts basically the empire into a Roman, uh, to a Christian empire. So um, at this point, I think you can't ignore Christianity anymore, right? They won big time. This is, this is the big winner of the ancient world. And this is where we start getting references to Christianity. Not overt ones that refer to Jesus and to Christianity in general. They're not that many. And so this is when scholarship tended to say, no, Christians and Jews had not, not a lot to do with each other, didn't bother them too much. What we have discovered, and I think my research is part of it in recent years, that the reason we said that is because we didn't know what we were looking for. We didn't understand how rabbinic literature works. And in fact, rabbinic literature does have, and I deal with the Babylonian Talmud, but other sources as well, does have references to Christianity, but we know, you need to know what you were, where to look for. The references to Christianity are satirical. They're funny, they're, they're hidden, they're, they're you know, suggested. There's allusion to Christianity. For example, those you know, heretic stories, a lot of them don't mention Christianity at all, and, and you just have to like, you know, understand what's happening. Some of the sources that have to do with monastic, the Christian of monks, don't mention Christianity at all. So he does refer to Christianity, but not openly. So if you know that and you find Christianity, then it becomes really interesting. But uh, why it was done this way, that oh. it's hidden? Because they were afraid? Good question, but no one knows the answer to that. Oh. This, is, this is really debatable a question. Why is that? Why are they doing it this way? So some scholars suggest yes, that they were scared to do it. Some scholars say that this was a, um, a genre lit of literature which attracts more people. We don't know. That's what the answer is. But first, let's say that we haven't even begun to explore this process. We're just beginning to look at those sources and look at it. We haven't done enough of the work to actually answer that. I don't, I don't know if we'll have an answer. But once we do that, and then we understand what they're doing with Christianity, then we understand that, yes, Judaism was bothered by Christianity, was bothered by Christian beliefs, Christian biblical interpretation, Christian attitudes towards certain, uh, certain topics in theology and biblical interpretation and praxis. And the, the rabbis are worried about this and they so are engaging in fact, in fact, they were challenged by the Christian theology. We might say this totally. openly. Yes. We just have to know where to look and how to look for it. And this we've only now begun to do. Because we didn't know how to, what to look for in the sources, we didn't know. So we just assumed they didn't that much. Now that we know, there's so much more to look for, and we're just beginning to do that. I'm sure if you'll interview me in a few years, I'll have a different answer for you, because I'll know much more. And this is, has to be a promise that you interview me again. But I'm saying for now... So record it. Record it on tape. <laughs> for now, the, uh, the, the amount of material we have about Jewish-Christian interaction is, is we have some sources, but not enough. We're just beginning to look for it. And, and we're, we're going to do the work and we're going to find more. And I'm sure we do because we keep finding more and more and more because now we know what we look for. And then it becomes interesting because the question is, if they're threatened by it, if they're challenged by it, then it also means that they're building their identity in and against this building Christianity. So not just from the Christian side, but also from the Jewish side. Could you maybe elaborate more on this uh, using concrete examples from the text, from the Talmud? Okay, so we talked a little bit about Jesus stories, right? So Jesus stories are very important and also because they're um, open about this, right? So you, you see the word Jesus, there's no confusion as to what are we talking about. It's anti-Christian, it's anti-Jewish, it's about Christianity, it's about Jesus. So, not anti-Jew, sorry, anti-Christian, anti right? So anti-Jesus, we see that and we can actually uh, talk about what they say about Christianity very openly. A lot of the stories I'm talking about doesn't have the word Christianity on it, so it's harder to find. So let's start with overt, right, Christian references. So we talked a little bit about Jesus' tradition, but let's talk about the name of Jesus, for example, right? So Jesus is called Jesus ben Pantira in the early sources. Later in the Talmud becomes Jesus the Nazareans, Yoshua Nutsri. When we talk about Jesus ben Pantira, the, Tam the, the rabbinic sources, uh, the Tosefta and stuff, doesn't explain why he's called this way. The son of Pantira, what is that? And this is where it gets really, really cool. Origen, which is a church father in the beginning of the third century, quotes a pagan guy who writes in the second century called Kelsen. And this guy Kelsen writes a book against Christianity, a very fierce 
attack on Christianity. And while he's doing that, he uses a Jew. He quotes a lot of stuff that the Jews say. So we have Celsus' Jew. Now, this guy disappeared. We don't have his writing anymore, this pagan guy, because, you know, uh, 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 Greco-Roman religion disappeared, so we don't have his writing. But because Origen answered him, Origen quotes a lot of his stuff. So Origen, in fact, the Christian church father, preserved those claims. And in that, there's a quote from the Jew, and the Jew explains what Jesus Bentatira means, which is really cool. If we didn't have that explanation, we wouldn't have known. And what does Kelsen say? That the Jews say, they used to say, ah, you're saying that he was born, this Jesus was born from a virgin woman? What are you talking about? We know that woman. She lived in the Galilee. And she had a son while she was engaged or married to this Joseph guy. She had a son outside of the marriage with this guy, with a Roman soldier named Pantera. Okay. So all of a sudden we understand why the rabbis are calling Jesus son of Pantera. They're basically saying... We know who you are. You're a son of a Roman soldier your mother had sex with. So they're calling him a bastard, right? They're calling him an illegitimate child. Now, we didn't know that if we didn't have that outside story explaining what it means. But this is how the rabbis call him. So they make fun of Jesus the, by, by calling him that, which is extremely cool, right? This is, this is, this is interesting. By the way, uh, one scholar uh, figured out, suggested in the 19th century, that it's interesting that the Roman soldier is called Pantheras of all names. Pantera is pan panther, right? The, the, an animal. But Pantera also sounds very, very close to the word Parthenos. So Pantheros, panther, sounds a lot like Parthenos. Now Parthenos means a virgin. So a scholar suggested that the Jews were making fun of the son of the virgin, the son of the Parthenos, and instead called him the son of a Pantheros, right? You say he's the son of a virgin, we say he's the son of a Roman soldier, right? So they're making fun of his name by using a, a word that's very close. So that, that, that's that. So this is a good example to show of a case where they're making fun of Jesus by calling him by name, but again, it never explained. You're supposed to know what it means, and we didn't even have Kelsus, we wouldn't know. So again, they're making fun, and you have to know the background to it. If we jump to other sources that don't mention Christianity explicitly, but actually talk about um, Christianity in a veiled way, that you need to know what it means, uh, I'll give an example for something that's polemic, something that they fight with Christianity, something that they are uh, um, actually borrowing from Christianity. I can give an example that really shows also the side of, of the dialogue that's not polemic. So, for example, in my book, in one of my books, I show, I take the example of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in his cave. This is a very, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is a very uh, important figure in the later reception of Jewish history because he becomes the hero of the Zohar, which is, you know, the book of the Kabbalah, the Kabbalah movement that becomes really, really important worldwide. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the hero, the literary hero of this book. And so the story about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in his cave is based on uh, a story that's found in the Babylonian Talmud. And this is a story about him staying in a cave, because he runs away from the Romans, and he's, um, he's fed by a miraculous tree and miraculous fountain, and he uh, sits all day in, in, in prayer and study of the Torah. Um, and it's a really, really weird story in the rabbinic landscape because rabbis don't go into cave and they don't study in cave and it's like the one story that we have and what i showed in my book is that this book ha this story has a s remarkable parallels to the most important literature of late antiquity of that time period which is the literature of the monks and we have entire stories about monks going into cave living off miraculous trees and miraculous water. And I really show how the story about Rabbi Shimon bar Chaz is in fact an echo, a dialogue of a story, uh, of stories about holy men, Christian holy men living in caves at the same time. And the rabbis basically create a figure that speaks like them, does like them, and, and it is. Now, Rabbi Shimon bar Chai is totally kosher. He studied Torah. He becomes, later on, the, the hero of the Zohar because the story has nothing to do with Christianity. Christianity is not mentioned. But what I try to show is that basically whoever writes this story uses literary tropes from Christian literature to think about issues that stand at the heart of both religion, which is asceticism. Do you have to suffer to be a good scholar? Yes or no? Uh, how does one 
what's the best way to spend your time in study, in prayer, in working the land, yes or no, right? Uh, uh, um, or in labora, Torah v'avoda, the study versus work, right? So how do you navigate the two? So st to questions like that, and the way to discuss it, they do it by incorporating literary tropes or monastic literature. So this is an example where a story in the Talmud, which becomes a very famous story, is in fact a literary dialogue with Christian literature of the time, which was extremely popular and all over the place, and whoever writes the story knows that and uses that. So these are examples, and there's, there's more examples such as this, where Christian literature and thinking about Christian tropes really influence and really comes in conversation with whatever is, it's found in the Babylonian Talmud. So that's an that's example of that, alongside examples of polemics and, and arguing with and, and fighting with. What the past, the relations between these two religions can actually teach us about our present time? I love that question because it really um, talks about the role of studying history in our life, right? Because at the end of the day, people are people, right? Humans are humans. And uh, sometimes when we learn about the past, we tend to imagine it being very different from our world. And when it comes to, you know, context between religion, for some reason, a lot of the time, scholarship tend to think about religion separately, as if each religion developed on its own. And people never work this way. They don't work like this today, and they never worked like this in the past. People live side by side. And we see that in archaeology. You walk in the streets in Sepphoris, and you see a church next to a synagogue in the ancient world. And people lived side by side, and they were in contact with one another. And religion and, and community come in contact with each other, and they influence each other, and they talk with each other. They uh, uh, polemicize, and they build their relationship from one another, next to another. And this was the case in the ancient world, and we have to understand that when we're looking back. And that's the case in the world we live in today. And so uh, when we look at the past and we say, always people lived side by side and had conversation when we're talking about the religious history of the past, it's the same thing that happens today. And Again, humans are complicated, religions are complicated, and it's never as simple as that. And the, the attempt to create religion as being something separate, pure on its own, was never the case in the past, and it's never the case here today. And, and, the, and the attempt to create those boundaries uh, actually misses or, or mistakenly present religion as they were. Each religion was created in its time and context, in the past and in the present. Another thing that we can learn from that is that my own work to talk about the Babylonian Talmud and the way its, relation, its relationship with Christians of the past teaches me that a lot of the tradition we know from the Talmud that made an impact on religious history was in fact created in conversation with Christian culture and beliefs and, and thoughts. And a lot of the stuff we do today and things we believe actually comes from that world. And it makes me... You know, we talked about uh, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his cave and the relationship of the, uh, you know, the, the historical development and how it came to be in connection with Christianity. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai cave is a place where a lot of Jews come and, and, and you know, visit and once a year and, and, and see it. It's a, it's, a, it's a pilgrimage site. Everyone comes to see it. It always makes me very happy to, happy to know that in the past, this was you know, influence and, and directed because Christian did that with holy men and they, they were the people. So it makes me happy to think that, that people you know, uh, um, were influenced and in dialogue with other religion. And until today, this has an impact that starts with a conversation between religions. So when we live in a world where tolerance is going uh, uh, less and less towards other religions and there's fighting over religion and there's uh, uh, um, animosity and, and anti-Semitism and anti-other religion and, and, and racism um, and this attempt to say to define each religion and each group on its own was never the case. Always conversation between religion, no religion developed separately and purely as its own thing. Every religion can come with it. It's true that they defined what they are and they made themselves special and they made themselves, um, you know, they made something of themselves in relation to the others, but in relation to the others, right, it was always in conversation and always connected. 
So I think it sends a message that people are complicated. They were always complicated. Re you know, relig religion and religious societies, um, you know, they, they are built alongside and side by side other religion. And that's important to remember in the world that tries to be very um, simplistic and very crude. It was never the case, not in the past and not in the present. And it should really lead us to more um, tolerance and more, um, you know, understanding of the other and, uh, and the complicated relationship uh, that always exists between Judaism and Christianity yeah, and so other religions. We, we always had to know how to coexist and probably we will keep that Doing in the future. as well. Professor Michal Barasher-Segal, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.